Hey, Pastor Gary here for another Wednesday Word. I hope uh, and pray that this finds you doing well. Uh, you know, before we get into the Wednesday Word, there's there's been a lot that's happened in the last 24 hours as it relates to Texas and the mask mandate and opening up the church. And, and uh, I just want to take a minute to talk about the mask mandate. You know, um, as, as far as Believer's Fellowship uh, goes, you know, we've never... Uh, required masks to be worn. We have encouraged masks to be worn, and and we still encourage that. I mean, you you know your health, you you know your health history and where you are, what deficiencies you have, and, and so if, if that's what you want to do, continue to wear a mask. Then and praise God, wear a mask. Uh, but I would just ask those that that feel like they don't need, they're not going to wear them anymore, that to be sensitive to to others. Um, we want to uh, be sure that whatever we do glorifies God and whatever we do brings unity to the church and, and to God's people. Uh, we don't want this to to separate us and, and to alienate uh, different sides, you know, what, whatever, if you're for mask or against mask or, or wherever in between, we don't want to create silos uh, of thought. Uh, we want to be united uh, as one church, as one body glorifying God. And so, you know, having two campuses in two, in, in two different counties creates, uh, you know, uh, how we handle things. But, uh, uh, you know, that, that, that mask, the repealing of the mask mandate doesn't take effect until next uh, Wednesday, that's March 10th. Um, and, and, and so we would just ask to, to use wise judgment, use discernment. Um, and, and so again, it, it you know, exercise personal responsibility. Uh, and, and that's all I'll say on that. Uh, you know, we still have our, our guidelines on our website. We're still going to uh, sanitize. We're still going to have our sanitizing stations. We're still going to do the things that we know, know to do to keep people safe, you know, and, 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 you know, reminding people to wash their hands and, and things like that. Our rows are still going to be separated. Um, you know, because we feel that again, we want to bring unity to the church. We we don't want to continue. We don't want to separate, and we want people to come back to church. And, and so again, that's all I'll say on that. Uh, and, and so just again, one final thing is just use personal responsibility when it comes to uh, wearing mask and and knowing what you're susceptible to and and you know where you are in, as far as your health goes. Um, okay, so uh, Wednesday word. Um, if someone asked you to summarize the Bible in five words or less, how would you answer them? How would you summarize the Bible in five words or less? You know, I thought about that, and, and my response was God's glory and man's salvation. Well, suppose you were asked to reduce the entire Bible into two words. So you went from five words now to two words. So how do you summarize the entire Bible in two words? Well, for me, that's actually easier than five words because now it's just two words. And those two words are simple. Jesus Christ. Think about it. All the glory of God and the salvation of man are both bound up in that wonderful name, Jesus Christ. Look at Acts 4.12. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Paul writes in Philippians 2, 9 through 11, For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow for those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Today, I would like to focus on a biblical portrait of Jesus. This biblical portrait is found in 1 Timothy chapter 2. For those of us who already know Jesus, my prayer is that you get to know him better, more intimately, to love and appreciate him more. For those who do not know Jesus, my prayer is that you come to know him, not in a religious way, but in a personal way, as your Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Father God, we just come to you now, Father. We do give you all the great, all the glory, Father. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy, Father. Father, we pray, Father. I pray, Father, that that this message message just resonate, Father. That we do come to a place, Father, to appreciate you, to know you more intimately, Father. To thank you, and to 
praise you in all in everything that we do, Father. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to go to 1 Timothy 2. And we're going to be in 1 Timothy 2, 2 and we're going to read uh, verses 1 through 6. So 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 6. And this is God's word. It says, first of all, then I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. Well, amen. Two reasons why, you know, we must pray. It, it, the first reason is that we may lead a, a so that we may lead a, a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. The second reason why we need to pray is because prayer is good and acceptable to God who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. See, Paul is urging us to pray for all men, for all classes, nations, and races of men, but especially for those people in positions of authority. But what is this truth that, that we come to know, right? It, it, it says there it, it, to come to the truth of the knowledge. So what is this truth that God wants us to acknowledge so that we might be saved? It's the singularity of God. In verse 5, it says, for there is one God. This one God who made the heavens and the earth, all things that are seen and unseen, exist above and beyond our senses. And though we cannot see or feel God, he is no less real and vital in our lives. There is only one God, not thousands like so many people want to believe this today that they think they're their own God. No, there's not one God for the Western world, one God for the Eastern world, one God for the Middle East. One God for this religion, one God for that religion. There is only one true living God. This one God transcends all nations, languages, races, cultures, people, and generations. 1 Corinthians 8 chapter uh, verses 5 and 6 says, For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for him. And one God, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. The second truth is the role of Christ. There is one mediator between God and man, and that is the man Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy 2.5 says we are given a portrait of Jesus as a mediator. A mediator is someone who stands in the middle, an intercessor, a go-between. Let's look at some aspects of Jesus' role as the only mediator between God, us and God. See, Jesus Christ is the supreme problem solver. A mediator is someone who, who settles disputes, resolves conflicts, to bring people together. As the divinely appointed mediator between God and man, it's Jesus' role to make peace between a holy God and a sinful man. See, by our nature, we have an internal resistance and hostility to God. We struggle with all the basic issues of who God is. That's why we want to be our own God. Our fallen nature disdains God's sovereignty. We, it resists his authority. We, we want to tell God or think we, 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 want to have, we want to make God think the way we think. We want to tell God what he ought to do and not do. So consciously or subconsciously, outwardly or inwardly, we have a natural tendency to fight against God. Our sin nature separates from God, separates us from God. In God, there's nothing but light. In us, there's nothing but darkness. Is there any question as to why we need a mediator? We're separated. Our sin separates us from God. The second aspect of Jesus' role as the only mediator is the only mediator is that Jesus is the only one that is uniquely qualified to do the work of mediation. Only Jesus fully and perfectly identifies with both God and man. 
In Titus 2.13, he is called the great God and our Savior. In 1 John 5.20, the true God. In Isaiah 9.6, the mighty God. In Romans 9.5, the eternal blessed God who is over all. 1 Corinthians 2.8, the Lord of glory. Paul wrote in Colossians 1.15-16, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth. Visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Colossians 2 9 says, For in him and the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Jesus himself declares in, in John 10 30, I and my Father are one. And yet, at the same time, Jesus is a, is a complete and perfect man. John 1.1 1, 1 and verse 14 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and he beheld his glory. So at the same time, Jesus is both man and God, perfectly representing God to us and representing us to God. Another aspect of his role as mediator is Jesus Christ reconciles us into God. Jesus settles every dispute and controversy, resolves every problem and difficulty. We are justified before God when we accept him as our Lord and Savior. Now you might ask, how can I be justified before God if I'm a sinner? I mean, God is too holy, too pure for sinners to come to him. And you're absolutely right. But there's a man seated next to him on the throne. He is our mediator. Jesus gave himself as a ransom for our sins becoming our substitute, paying the price for our transgressions, suffering the wrath of God, taking our place and our punishment. Hebrews 7.25 says, Therefore he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercessions for them. I want to end with this. There's a, a song uh, called In Christ Alone, and I'm not going to sing it to you, so, so that's a blessing in itself. Uh, but I'd like to read the lyrics to you. And, and, and this is the lyric. These are the lyrics to the song. Um, and I'm going to try to do it without, without crying, so we'll see how that goes. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. His, this cornerstone, this solid ground firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone who took on flesh, fullness of God and helpless babe. This gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me. For I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's, life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. Till he returns or calls me home, here in the power of Christ I, I'll stand. See, it is in Christ alone that we have salvation. It is in Christ alone that we are forgiven of our sins. It is in Christ alone that we were that we are able to spend eternity in heaven. If you don't know Christ today, that's what you're missing. If you're trying to go through this life on your own, thinking you can do it on your own, you can't. You can't pay the sin debt that you, that, that you have. You need a mediator. And that's where Christ comes in. Accept him as your Lord and Savior. Savior. Ask him to forgive you of your sins so that you can spend eternity in heaven and be forgiven of your sins. If you know Christ as your Savior, but you've walked away, come back. He's waiting for you. Amen? Well, amen. Well, let's pray. Father God, 
Father, we thank you for your blood, Father. We thank you for the opportunity, Father, to come to you and seek forgiveness of our sins, Father. I thank you that you took on our sin, sin debt, Father, and you paid that debt for me, Father, so that I could spend eternity in heaven, Father. Father, I pray for those that don't know you, Father. Father, I pray that right now where they are, Father, Father, that they just seek, they just seek your face, Father. Father, for those that have turned away from you, Father, that they turn around, Father, and turn from themselves and, and, and come to you, Father. Father, for those of us who are following you, Father, Father, thank you for the reminders, Father. Thank you for, for, for all that you've done for us, Father. We give you all the praise and all the glory, Father. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, amen. Well, hey, I look forward to seeing you in church on Sunday. Don't forget, we're having our Easter services April 4th, having two services at both of our locations at 9 o'clock and 1045 at our Magnolia and Spring Campus. I'd love to see you there. If you're not able to, to make it in person, you can definitely join us online uh, via Facebook or our website. For more information, go to our website at bfchurch.com or contact the church, 281 350 nine six seven three also don't forget your tithes and offerings and uh pray that we see you on sunday god bless